Okay, Before we get started Where's tonight, and how many people here remember Roy Rogers? Oh. How many people remember the name of Dale Evans' horse? Triggerette. <laughs> you are the man of the hour. <laughs> it was an inside joke. I want you to know the brainiac behind the Cleveland Clinic thought the horse's name was Buttercup. So. But at least, so, at least it was not two pounds of butter. Two pounds of butter. So we started yucking during the butter. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy yes. Snyderman from NBC News and uh, MSNBC. And because my parent company is GE, invited to the symposium tonight, Mike Barber, uh, Vice President of Health Imagination and GE um, Medical Health, Scott McFarland from the Cleveland Clinic, and obviously Antonio, from, who's finalist at Top Chef, yes. and the um, executive chef of Foxtail in Los Angeles. Thank you all for being here tonight. We're here to talk about, to really to kick this off, talk about health and wellness and medicine and food and how we nourish ourselves and how we're going to change, I think, the conversation of health and wellness globally. Um, as we look at technology being cooler and neater than ever, healthcare dollars being scrunched, um, a very fat American populace with global obesity on the rise. Um, so tonight, we're going to take your questions and make this an open forum and, frankly, put these people who are the leaders in their own fields a little bit on the hot spot. So, um, Mike, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you have committed your life to um, health and wellness at GE. You're now Vice President of Health Imagination, and you have a very, very big budget committed toward changing. Is it $6 billion, am I correct? From now to So, I mean, you alone could help President Obama if you really cared. <laughs> so, with $6 billion in a high-tech industry, what do you want to accomplish? What we're doing with Health Imagination is, as she said, really looking at the global perspective of health. And in every healthcare system around the world, there are areas where you need to improve access, we want better quality, and we want a lower cost. And so we're going to be investing in a number of innovations targeted just at that. So what can we do to make sure we have the right kind of products that can be targeted at different populations around the world to meet the healthcare systems? How you provi provide healthcare in rural India is very different than how you would do it in Bangalore or in Chicago. So what are the specific applications and technologies that you need there? But you see this as a business. It is absolutely a business. It is important for us because health is a big issue around the world. So bringing the right kind of products and services, we think, is a good business proposition. Similar with, and it encompasses the portfolio more than the high-tech imaging equipment, but in some parts of the world, clean water is health care. So our water technology business can be a part of that. Uh, refrigeration for vaccines with our consumer industrial and our appliance business. So it is something that's business for us. It's something that we want to do. Similar eco-imagination, green is green. We can do that as well in health. So from a business standpoint, do you do well economically by doing good things? Absolutely. Because it, it, if it's not sustainable if it's just high cost, high tech, and it's, it, if, if our customers, hospitals, if healthcare systems around the world are bankrupt, it's not going to be useful for us. You and I know that there are hospitals throughout India and through Africa that have graveyards littered with GECT scanners. High-tech things that American corporations have dumped with all good intentions, with no one to find to service them and no parts. How are you going to change that? So when you talk about that $6 billion, $3 billion is for products, $2 billion is for financing, a billion dollars is for content, service, sustainability. Because you're right, the, the equipment is the easy part if you're talking about developing countries. There you really have to have a plan for sustainability. So we've opened up new um, buildings and new facilities in sub-Saharan Africa and we're training people to do servicing on that equipment. Uh, so we're, we're there for the long term. One of the things I'm going to ask our panelists to do tonight is to make this a conversation and not just, you know, a, a one at a time. So in order to do that, I have to pick on my next participant, um, Scott McFarland, who's very easy to pick on. But um, so the president has um, basically, the Mayo Clinic has bashed the president's plan. The president has sucked up to the Cleveland Clinic and has been, spent the last week there. So what did you all accomplish this week? You know, uh, we were thrilled to be hosting the president yesterday uh, at Cleveland and Cleveland Clinic. 
clinic in, in the community of, uh, of Shaker Heights. The, what we did yesterday with uh, President Obama dealt around health information technology, dealt with wellness and prevention, and also some of the exciting advances in medical technology and medical procedures uh, that the Cleveland Clinic is uh, consistently rated as one of the top hospitals in the world. And how do you um, take what the president wants to accomplish mm -hmm. through health care reform mm -hmm. and what the Cleveland Clinic has talked about and find common ground between your health care professionals and what the president wants to see? Is there common ground? There certainly is a common ground. I haven't heard him talk about um, personal responsibility and health prevention. We're still mm -hmm. in the disease mode. We're still in the disease and we're still in the sickness care business. But you know, Cleveland Clinic has stepped out in a leadership role and focused a lot on wellness prevention and health education. We've got programs like Lifestyle 180, which is a six week intensive class or course where the 12 to 16 participants come together uh, twice a week for four hours and basically relearn how to cook and prepare food, relearn how to exercise, and relearn how to basically relieve stress and stressors in their lives. They also spend the final hour learning about the disease state that they are all uh, experiencing, whether it's metab metabolic syndrome, COPD, congestive heart failure. We actually have about 22 diseases that we are targeting, not only to help these people manage disease, but really through a six-week intensive plan, reverse the disease. We at the Cleveland Clinic want to be in the disease reversal business, not the disease management business. So to, to give you some fuel to go on tonight, I want to give you a little bit of a laundry list as to what the Cleveland Clinic has done the last few years. 2005, smash the ash, and all, all clinic campuses go smoke-free, something that, frankly, General Electric needs to get with. Agreed. Agreed. And <laughs> I'm sick and tired of walking through the cigarette smoke at 30 Rocks. Okay, 2007, banned trans fats from all public and patient menus at the Cleveland Clinic, even McDonald's. Even McDonald's, big public fight with McDonald's. But we, 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 did, uh, we did experience and allow McDonald's to test vegetable oils in their fryers, and they adopted it. And we were Are the French fries as good? They're very good. Very Are they good. as good? I don't eat many they French should, fries. They should, they they should be as should good? Be. Absolutely. So the trans fats Between, don't mean anything? Yeah. A vegetable, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, 2007 established a wellness institute with Mike Roizen as the country's first chief wellness officer, something Mike's doing very well. 2007, and I don't know about the legality of this, but I know it's being done, <laughs> stopped hiring smokers. Absolutely. We now, I know that this is a state-by-state state issue because I had a nice meeting with the CEO of a very <laughs> prominent business, and I think federally it may not be sustainable, but state-by-state state, it must be legal in Cleveland. Well, you or, know, or I should say Ohio. We, we operate. We operate hospitals in Ohio. We operate hospitals in Florida. We Are operate you hospitals your in Nevada, and we uh, have we everyone that begins employment at Cleveland Clinic does uh, have a smoking uh, test. To, to the test. And how do you test them? Blood uh, or hair? Uh, no, it's urine. Uh, it's a urine test. So it's a is a cotinine really? test. Yeah, cotinine. Right, cotinine test. So if you have cotinine in your urine, you don't get hired. We give you well. You have the opportunity to. Participate. You know, there would be no one at Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> you you have the opportunity to participate in a smoking cessation class or, or program that we pay for, and then you're invited six months later to reapply for the position. So we actually have people take us up on that. We get them off cigarettes for six months, and then they're able to work for the second largest private employer in the state <laughs> of Ohio. Well, what if someone's with, uh, who's married to like a smoker and it's secondhand smoke that they're ingesting? Would that show up in their urine? It would not show it up would, in their urine. Okay. No, it would not. That was up. a superb question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It, it, it's better than my. I didn't mean to like. Ra I'm like raising my. Better hand. than my. <laughs> I got in school. Better than my supreme question. Which yes. Is it <laughs> Oh, the, <laughs> there, there, we've also, uh, of course, we do have, none of our staff can smoke on campus. And uh, we have, um, we've actually uh, helped transition employees we've caught uh, smoking on campus. So we actually do terminate for smoking. Uh, but there's also pieces of property that we don't own that are adjacent to Cleveland Clinic. And there is an entrepreneur who charges a buck <laughs> for people that are on our property whether they're patients, caregivers, or, or even employees, to go over and smoke on his property. So oh it has generated a small cottage industry, but uh, we're working with him to, uh, <laughs> That's to help good. transition. That's good. We thinking. love entrepreneurship. Is there a question out there? Do we want to wait? Or Antonio, you'll love this. Obama applied to the Cleveland Clinic. Would you hire him? He smoked. 
<laughs> Do you, uh, You're my buttermilk man. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know anything important. <laughs> the, the, certainly we are willing to work with the president if he, if he, if he is indeed a smoker. No, what do you uh, mean if he is indeed a smoker? <laughs> It, 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 we are certainly willing to. But you know, that raises a good question for all three yeah. of you. What is the responsibility of the leadership in our country mm -hmm. to talk the talk and walk the walk? If we're really talking about health care reform and we only have a finite amount of money and we know that cigarettes and obesity are the two leading causes of disease and pestilence in this country, the need, and if the Cleveland Clinic doesn't have access, nobody does, to help Barack Obama quit his cigarettes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's your job. We should step up and we should definitely help the president. I agree. Okay. And this leads to you, Antonio. In 2008, the Cleveland Clinic launched weekly farmers markets for employees and community, which I think is extraordinarily yes. important. And then um, in last year, Shape Up and Go Three Month Team, um, um, employee walking and fitness. So before I let you off the hook, what do you have planned for 2010? Oh, that's exciting. Uh, 2010 will involve working with Health Imagination and the GE companies. We're actually launching, not only going to serve patients and our employees, we're actually going to launch in the consumer channel with mind, body, and food offerings that allow people to have six to eight to 24 week experiences with Cleveland Clinic expertise, guidance, accessible science, and clinicians to help them lead a better, healthier life. So we're, we're going to do a big online play into the, uh, into the consumer channel. Antonio, one of the things we're going to talk about this weekend is the um, fat undernourished person. Um, you know, the fat, undernourished person, I, I just want to start by saying um, it, it starts at home. It starts with people's parents. It starts from a very young age um, teaching people how to eat properly. Um, you know, I obviously work in the restaurant industry, so it's, you know, I, I was French trained, so it's all about the fat and the butter and whatever. But when you're at home, um, the, the basics that you need to sustain yourself um, are not the potato chips and the Pop-Tarts and all these other things that we go to the store and we buy. Um, it's the fruits and vegetables. It's the lean proteins and fish. It's, um, you know, good carbohydrates like yam and brown rice. Um, and I, I feel like when I talk about healthy eating, I get so many people who are like, it's so expensive to eat. It's so expensive to eat healthy. And that is the biggest fallacy there's, that's out there. Yes, Whole Foods is very expensive, and you do have markets that are, you know, are, that are very pricey with their organic fruits and vegetables. And but then the take me market. into, take me into the Bronx at the typical corner store. Yes, if I was to go into that store, okay, they still have proteins, they still have fruits and vegetables, and they have beans, which are like. I mean, really, if you want to get into inexpensive, really inexpensive, high nutrient, high fiber, fiber, excuse me, um, legumes. It's like you get dried beans. What are they? Ninety-nine cents for a pound. You know, it lasts. You can. I could make. You know, between four to six meals for a family of four with that. Between soups and stews, or even just them by themselves with some brown rice. Very, very filling, um, and delicious if, if they're cooked properly. Um, but it, it's really, it's mind-boggling when people go into the stores and they're filling their, you know, carts up with, you know, uh, high fructose corn syrup cereals and potato chips and, um, you know, like I said, Pop-Tarts or fruit roll-ups for their kids. Um, and it's infuriating because send them to school, like how I remember I being sent to school, you have your sandwich, you have your piece of fruit, and you had your milk, and that was it. Now, like, these lunch bags are, like, seven or eight different things. Children are overeating. It's, it's like, it's totally, like, skyball. Um, but not to get off the point of going into the store and, you know, if you were to go into the store and literally just buy what you needed, which is, you know, maybe a bag of oatmeal of oats for your breakfast, um, you know, lean proteins, um, some starch that's great, like yam and brown rice, beans, and your fruits and vegetables, you would spend a lot less than all the other fillers that we like to bring into our home. But this audience is the already converted, worried well, pred predominantly white yes. audience. Sir. Well, we're going to get you a microphone so everyone can hear. But suppose that you actually live in the Bronx and you just spent two shifts working as cashier at Walmarts with minimum wage and with no yes. health insurance. 
Is that the time to cook beans from scratch, which need to be soaked overnight, or is it time to go to McDonald's? Just I, a question. You know, the truth of the matter is, I so understand the struggle of wanting to get something quick. You know, you are at work for 12 hours a day. You, you have a screaming child that gets in the car, and they're, you know, going to eat their arm off. They're so hungry. I, I, I live that, you know what I mean? Like, I've lived that life before, you know, fortunately, I've had so many wonderful opportunities. But, you know, I, I'm a single mom. I work 14 to 15 hours a day when I open my restaurant. And I understand that. And I looked at it where when I'm not, when the, it's about being organized and it's about teaching those skills of organization and nutrition to every area of, you know, the economy of, or the economic um, balance of people. Um, because it is that way. I mean, I do see it all the time where, um, you know, obviously people with lower income families, there is no education from a very young age. You know what I mean? And, I mean, you look, and McDonald's is on every street corner, you know, in the lower income areas, you know, and, you know, where I live in Los Angeles, you drive through Beverly Hills and there's nothing. You know, so it's, you know, it's targeted, and I get that, but that's where it starts one, from the very... One, one thing we did as an employer, uh, and we have 56 food service locations that are employees because we have 42,000 employees in our, in our system, we made grab-and-go options, basically less than four grams of fat, no trans fat, less than four grams of sugar, made from whole grains and low in sodium. We put these grab-and-go menu items, we, pr we priced them between four and six dollars, and we have noticed a shift in our employees grabbing the healthy options if the options are prepared as consumer packaged goods. So we intend to work with companies like GE and the companies that they're connecting with, whether it be General Mills or Walmart or other companies that they're able to bring to the table to help theme this grab-and-go kind of go foods mentality of bringing healthy consumer packaged goods to places where people grab and go. We just want to get them Absolutely. to have healthier options. And on that pause, I'm going to take a question from over here. So I have a small question. I, I applaud your diligence in not hiring people to smoke, but clearly many more people in this country are dying and getting sick from obesity than smoking. Are you going to stop hiring the obese? <laughs> Surprisingly, that is the first time I've had that question publicly, so I applaud you. Welcome for, to Aspen. For, for, well, yeah, welcome to Aspen. You know, it, it, your shows are always so much fun, man, so yeah, I, I love them. The, um, there, there, certainly, that what we do a lot for our employees who are ob obese and who are overweight and are wanting to manage uh, their weight. We have no uh, plans of, of not hiring uh, people with a certain body mass index or, or, or going down that path. Um, what we do, though, for our employees that are overweight is we give them free Weight Watchers and we, we give them free fitness center memberships. We found that you know, hospitals employ a lot of lower wage workers in, in, in a lot of areas. We found that when we made our fitness centers free and that we gave away white Weight Watchers for free, we removed the barriers of cost and we found the triggers to make them exercise. And as long as they keep exercising and attending meetings, we continue to support that cost. I'd like to know down the line, should we tax soft drinks, yes or no? Scott. Yes. I, I just don't, I, we, sh we shouldn't even have soft drinks <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> a show from hands from the audience. Should we tax soft drinks to help pay for health care reform? Who, who says no? And why, all right, the microphone to this gentleman right okay. here. Oh, right, you, right, I'm sorry, I'm very stealing your microphone. I promise I'll come back to you. I have to steal your microphone for a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why should we not tax soft drinks? The microphone. We're, we're, we're still a nation that, that appreciates personal liberty and, and freedom. If, if, you but know, then you support cigarettes. I, it, it, my, my pop smoked Paul Malls forever. He's 74. I don't smoke. So, no, I don't, I, I don't, I don't support cigarettes. Do I support taxing the poor to pay the Health care for the rich? No, absolutely not. So, when so it's you a regressive tax. Uh, uh, absolutely it is. And it, there's no debate. Who smokes? Poor folks smoke. Rich, fo rich folks don't. So we're talking about... Well, when I, don't, you, I don't think that data holds up. Well, you know, well then, then, you know what? Then, 
I, I can give you five or ten or fifteen at the end of, the, of tonight of, 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 of data evidence that supports that if you, if you tax cigarettes, if you tax sh sugar colors and, and, and you know, sodas. Cigarettes are taxed up the wazoo. Yeah. That's just the right. point. Right. All right, I'm going to give you one more second to make this, this All right. point. You know, you walk on any street in New York City and go to the corner, the, the, the corner bodega, and guess what? You're paying $5 for cigarettes. Six. If you go, if, six or six no, you're paying five. If you go, no, if you go to the, the registered place where you have to buy cigarettes, you're paying $11. Wow. So taxes don't always work because okay. there, there, there are ways for folks to get around taxes. Microphone here and then the yellow, please. <clears throat> Well, let me agree here with the previous speaker. It has nothing to do with freedom of choice and everything to do with economics. Right now, smoking does follow a social gradient, poor and the minorities who smoke. It did not used to be the case. It really is the case now. And it is equally clear in New York City, it is actually the lower income groups and minorities who drink soda frequently. So if we tax cigarettes, are you saying we already tax cigarettes and it's set? We should not tax... I'm um, saying sodas? it's regressive taxation, and I'm saying that the best data so let me, that sodas in New York City so, are consumed by minorities and the poor come from Tom Frieden, So let me toss this back to you. If you accept that it's regressive taxation, but you tax it nonetheless, is there then an impetus for the more impoverished to not consume that product? No, it might be for the more impoverished. It's just a question. It's just a question. No, the question, the question I have, because I, I do give talks in places where one-third of the audience is obese, and it's usually women, and one-third of the audience is obese. And my question is, was it soft drinks or fast foods that make them obese? My question is, who was it that made them poor? What happened here to them? in the economy of this society and who made them poor? And that is the question. So as a result, all those things about taxation and subsidizing and fruit and vegetables do not begin to take into account the real issue, and that is the issue of disparities in, among social classes in diets and health. So the whole thing really goes back to disparities, and my suggestion to them would be go join a union. And we'll take the microphone back to the gentleman in the yellow. So let me ask you a question before we totally, you know, get unhinged in this, this kickoff this, session. This is better than live studio. Yeah. yeah. Down the line, will health care reform happen this fall? It, access and payments will happen with, to make sure access is there and some way to pay for it. Not necessarily health care reform where you're talking about doing things to change the way the payment system happens, doing things like the Cleveland Clinic. That probably won't happen. That's a second act. But do you think there will be some there legislation? There will be some legislation to provide access for more and how we're going to pay for it through taxation or other ways. I agree. There will be movement and there will be progress, uh, and uh, we look forward to that. Yes, sir. Clarification <laughs> on, the, uh, on the progressive regressive question. Um, the problem with that conversation is that it always stops short term. Cigarettes, cigarette taxes are regressive immediately, but over the long term they become progressive because all of the surveys of cigarette taxation and what happens in communities, states and cities, in which taxes go way up as they have in New York City, is that poor smokers reach their break point first and they ultimately give up the habit, becoming healthier and becoming richer because they stop spending $10 a pack for cigarettes. It's wealthy people who then subsidize the tax because $10 a pack once a day makes very little difference when you're earning $500,000 a year. So we can call these taxes regressive, but only in a short horizon. In a long horizon, they become very successfully progressive taxes. Would you pass the microphone immediately by the woman in the white sweater, Julie Gerberding? You're not getting away from me. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, you will take anybody, you know. <laughs> Did you think I had something to add to that? <laughs> of course. So Julie, as former head of the CDC, Julie Gerberding is a Rossin. What's the role of the federal government in getting this country back on track 
with regard to health and wellness? I don't have time to answer question. <laughs> Could you make After a futile dinner, attempt? <laughs> but I can tell you that I think it is the most important question that we need to be asking in the context of this debate about health reform. Will we be healthier as a result of the decisions that are being made in Congress right now? And I don't think so far that the answer is yes. And why not? Because I think what we're talking about is redistributing how we pay for sick care. But we're not really talking about how we invest in health. Esther Dyson is applauding you. <laughs> so if we, are we not talking about well care because it's boring? I think we're not talking about it because health actually doesn't happen in the healthcare delivery system. It happens at home. It happens in schools. It happens in our communities. And there is nothing about the trillion dollar investment that we're considering right now that addresses any of those issues. And until we figure out that the first dollar should be spent at school or at community education or in some of the other things that we've kind of bantered about in this earlier big idea discussion, we're not actually going to end up creating more health for Americans. We may end up with a more equitable disease care system, but we're not actually going to be healthier. I, mean, I think Julie touched on extraordinarily important, and that is we've watched our neighborhoods be places where mothers are afraid to let their kids run. We have raped school budgets such that physical education no longer exists. We have allowed, whether you believe McDonald's is okay or not, a fast foodization um, of our schools. We've sort of gotten away from whole foods in the, mo in the purest sense. What's the role of a corporation like General Electric? Really has its fingers in so many cultures in health and wellness, and I've always maintained that GE is basically a health care company with great distribution. I mean, you, what's the role of, of sort of setting that part straight, starting with families and starting with schools, and not just making the world's best MRI scanner? And it's one of the things as part of Healthy Imagination, we're starting with our employees and our employee families. So we are looking at that to walk the talk in that area and, and turning our internal uh, occupational health clinics into health and wellness where access to the family talking about nutrition is a big deal something else GE does and is it, where we are have locations we often support the school systems so we're working with the GE foundation to go into the school systems and talk to them about health and wellness not just about curriculum because we think it's an important piece very early uh, in the stages so I think that corporations and industry can do that a third big piece is we have to make it easier for people to understand what's good for them or not. Because a lot do, of things that you're seeing that? that, it's targeted marketing. So really, what can you do to bring content to people, to bring it, to make it very easy when they go in and they see General Mills or they see Campbell's or they see whatever, is this good for me or is it not good for me? Instead of trying to look on the label and understand the percent of daily value and all those things, it makes it too difficult. So there are things we can do from an education front and from our own employee front. I hope we have more than one microphone, but <laughs> yes, sir. Ma'am, whoever, yes. She's pointing at the microphone. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to uh, your, uh, a moment of previous discussion. When you tax alcohol, cigarettes, and possibly soft drinks and other items, where does that money go? How is it redirected? Does it go to elementary schools for education? Does it go to uh, maybe subsidize health foods for people in these communities that you're talking about? What happens to that money? And um, if it doesn't go to the right places, I'm asking why not? Well, I can speak for California where I used to live. <clears throat> A lot of the cigarette money goes into education in K through 8. And in fact, if you want to look at a very low smoking population, look at people in San Francisco. You could always tell tourists because they were the people smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Um, and so there is proof that turning tobacco tax money into early childhood education matters. 
My personal bias is we do that very poorly. I don't think we do sex ed well. I don't think we do health and education well. And I think it starts in preschool. And I do think it's a combination of parental influence in schools together. And I, and I don't think we do it well as a nation. Oh. Wherever the microphone is. Yes. Doctor, I have a question for you. Um, what did you think of the now famous New Yorker article? Are you talking to me, this doctor? That's right, you. <laughs> what did you think of the New Yorker article uh, that sh showed Atul that McAllen, Texas, has the highest health care cost in the country? So Atul Gawande did a fascinating thing. He looked at health care consumption and outcomes research in two different communities in Texas and found that there was this extraordinary disparity. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing, that we are our hospitals and our doctors don't talk to each other. In fact, I can tell you, having had a patient recently in New York, um, a CT scan or an MRI scan at Columbia didn't read at NYU. We have, I don't care how much the Obama administration talks about improving IT, I think it is going to be a flat-ass failure for where we are right now because our hospitals don't know how to talk. Computer systems don't talk. And we, if I'm a spine surgeon and Mike's if I'm an orthopedic surgeon and Mike's a neurosurgeon and we get the same few patients with back problems, we're going to look at the problem very differently and our outcomes are going to be differently and we're going to build differently. There hasn't been enough attention paid to outcomes research and frankly sort of line item ideas as to how we screen patients and treat them. And I think Atul Gawande is frankly is one of the great, great, great thinkers of our time. I, I might also add, we at the Cleveland Clinic are a group practice model, so we're 1,800 physicians all united under one kind of banner. And you look at the outcomes we get as a, as a group practice model and the low-cost leadership that even President Obama has acknowledged in his speeches, um, I think you're going to see more and more thought leadership around the group practice model that, that uh, Cleveland Clinic and, and Mayo Clinic deploy in the market mix. You know, the problem with healthcare reform, you know, surgeon, is that we have a real a patchwork quilt of health care in this country. We have individual practitioners. I've been in academic practice and private practice. We have people who are fiercely independent. We have people who love group practice. We have multidisciplinary practices. So the idea of health care reform sort of fixing things, I don't know what the things are. And I, I think the conversation has to change to making things better, not perfect. Mm -hmm. and, and I, th I think sometimes we ask the wrong questions, and I think that that question really goes to the heart of it. That's true, and there, there are things in the <clears throat> stimulus package to look at comparative effectiveness research, to look at meaningful use for IT systems, but those, that work has to happen before it gets implemented. So that's why what we're discussing right now is a redistribution of payments I mean, and I'm, not true reform. If I'm correct, at the federal level, the CIA computers don't even talk to the FBI computers. And I, I really think there's, so we have to really be practical. And, and what I suggested to President Obama last week was why not take, why not go out to the Silicon Valley and say to the best companies, give me your five smartest kids and donate them to me for the next four or maybe eight years and loan their brains to fixing this system. We know we have the smarts. I mean, we're just celebrating our walk on the moon. We're talking about cancer research. I cannot believe we can't figure out computers. I mean, we're the it country. But why not go out to the Silicon Valley and say, bring us your best, and we're going to figure this out? What's the problem? Esther. I'm sorry. I'll come to you next. Yes, sir. So I want to go back to one of the things that's been a theme for a couple of the comments. Uh, McDonald's has been highly criticized, uh, and soft drinks have been brought up. And isn't the problem really that we need to get all the McDonald's, the Coca-Colas, and the like at one table to talk about how they can create products that are more nutritious and better for people? And in fact, the Aspen Institute is forming a task force on nutrition that's really designed to do just that bring people from government, from industry and the like together to, to try to see if we can address the problem in a, pro, in, a, in a productive way that will try to improve the health of all Americans and not let McDonald's be the whipping boy or Coca-Cola be the whipping boy anymore. And you have to say, I think you're right. I mean, you can go to McDonald's, and McDonald's does take the brunt of the crisis. It's become like the, the linoleum of the fast food industry. Yeah. Um, you're better off to get a hamburger 
then you are a salad and drench it in salad dressing. I mean, the reality the is thing. there are ways to eat and get your protein and feed a family. And I cannot tell a poor mother to go to the grocery store and get a pound of sirloin and get the hamburger buns and get the pickles and feed her family as inexpensively as she can if she gets four hamburgers. Leave out the French fries. Leave out the French fries. And let me, I'm getting a microphone right here. Es Esther. Thanks. To, to go back to Silicon Valley, I just want to be slightly encouraging. One thing we haven't really talked about is people's own about what they eat. Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, there's a lot of bright kids. They're working on helping people manage their own health, monitor their own nutrition, genomes, uh, how much they ran, all their behaviors. These people are the people that are going to integrate their health records, just the way Intuit helped everybody integrate their financial records. Finally after people started saying, I want to download my stuff both from my mutual fund and my bank and put them together. So they're not going to solve all the problems, but I think you're going to have a much more empowered, intelligent, better informed about their own data, demanding consumer set. And I think those guys, they, they may be only the top 20%. This is sort of the opposite of the regressive thing. They're going to make a huge difference, and the stuff they start demanding is going to start trickling down. They don't need to go work for the government. They're doing much better. <laughs> Can't they just go on loan? I'm in paycheck. Microphones, yes. Well, I want to go back to one of the question, um, one of the comments by Scott and and your institute and and one of the programs you were doing that did 10, 12 to fifteen people in a program that promoted health. And I think all of us here understand what it takes to be healthier, but how do we take that ill? I mean, 12 to 15 people, that's awesome. But is that really making an impact? Even if you do 12 to 15 people, 12 to 15 days, 365 right. days yeah. a year. I mean, how do we take that model and all of the ideas that you panelists have um, have projected out there. I mean, the GE models and, you know, we're all going to do all this great stuff, but how do we take it to scale? We, we have a plan. Uh, the, the, it's a great question because basically we are seeing some very promising early results with spending six weeks of intensive therapy twice a week for four hours with these 12 to 16 patients and seeing great outcomes at reversing their disease. And it takes about six weeks for these folks to get this of making the behavior change in the world. What we plan to do is franchise almost with a small the sort of lifestyle, what we call the Lifestyle 180 experience, so that other uh, innovators and entrepreneurs from across the country can have a physician or someone that's, that's clinically trained by the Cleveland Clinic to actually provide these, these experiences in communities and market service areas in, in, in places where they can draw up on an installed base of patients and, and consumers who want this intervention. What's holding back the, uh, the, the entrepreneurs in this area is who pays for the experience, the six-week experience. You know, our retail price for that is about $2,500 um, uh, per, per person to put them through this six-week six experience. Uh, we, do, we have some reimbursement from Medicare for uh, preventive cardiology. We're, li we're working with health uh, policy expert or health uh, reimbursement experts at Medicare and the state med Medicaid organizations. We're going to have to find some sort of sponsor payer to initially get these patients and participants into these programs to make the model sustainable. But we as the Cleveland Clinic, we're going to continue to serve the, the areas that we can serve, and we certainly stand ready to train those who want to partner with, with us. Mike Royzen, our chief wellness officer, has a saying. He wants w one Lifestyle 180 Center for every five McDonald's in this country. His plan is to put about 2,000 of these centers uh, in operation between now and 2018. So I, 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 we're going to stand ready to, to do that. Yes, sir. I just, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to get to the technology point that you had talked about earlier. You had raised the point about the cutting edge MRI or CT scan. I'm a breast cancer surgeon from Seattle. And I also direct a program for breast health care in low and middle income countries. 
one of the technology problems that I think we see is that it, it's the incentive issue that you mm -hmm. have. Our companies have the incentive to create the expensive, cutting edge uh, tools that may be a little bit better than the last tool that we had. But when we get into healthcare for in underserved communities or in low and middle income countries, it's actually hard to get companies to make the old stuff that actually works pretty well. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts about, is, are there ways that we could realign incentive so that companies could make inexpensive needles or make digit, the Volkswagen of digital mammography rather than the Mercedes Benz of digital mammography so that it could be available in, in these other, other environments? Mike. It is absolutely something that, that we're doing. We're not just looking at it, but typically what happens is the practice of medicine changes when you work in the academic center, as you said. You, you build better CTs, better MRs. Uh, one of the things that we're really doing is looking at doing a more patient-centric. What makes a difference to the outcome? And when you talk, really start talking about the outcome, it's the information flow, it's the ability to collaborate between different clinicians, it's understanding the healthcare system in your target market, and in India is different than it is in the US, and designing products specifically for that, putting the patient at the center, and what does it mean from an outcomes perspective? So we're doing a lot of work to really understand, is it really gonna change the course of care? Is it gonna change the course of treatment? Is it gonna change the outcome by putting an extra you know, 20 slices on the CT, and if it doesn't, don't add the cost, don't do it, let's think about those other things. So we are doing things in that area. And we have products in ultrasound, products in cardiac monitoring, mm -hmm. products in CT that are doing just that right now. And affordable and upkeepable? Absolutely, absolutely. Because if you're talking about a, a, portable, ultra, a portable cardiac machine that's used in India, it has to be battery powered because power goes out. It has to be robust because there's not as, as clean of an area that it's going to be working on. So a product targeted for that market has to be more sustainable than what you might typically get other places. Uh, yes, sir. The question is, on compensation, it, it appears that the compensation structure is all backwards in America. We pay, I mean, if it's only $2,500 to save a life, how much does a bypass surgery cost? So exactly. how do we turn... Health care, I mean, right now it's really sick care. We pay for sick care, we don't pay for health care. Is there somebody that's looking at reimbursing those modalities versus just doing more uh, heart surgeries and bypass surgeries? You know, we have the clinic, it's interesting. We're taking a, a tract with, uh, we're, we're making our science around lifestyle, health promotion, prevention, and wellness accessible to a consuming public through relationships like GE and the assets they have at NBC Universal, iVillage, et cetera. So we know that we can make our science and our innovation around this area accessible to a consuming public. We also see the trend in more consumers paying for a portion to keep themselves well, and we also think this will be emphasized in our society more and more as we advance the agenda forward. The issue is those folks that are on, that are on um, limited income, or fixed income and are sick presently, and how we get a, an addressable reimbursement model to uh, help them optimize their health, reverse their disease, or better manage their disease, uh, certainly we need to see some reimbursement progress in that area. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, is that working? Oh, good. Um, I have a simple question, which I would hope that we would uh, address a, at the conference, um, it's a question that's not actually asked in in the healthcare debate. Uh, there's historical reasons for that in the U.S. I mean, what we're going through today is not new. We went through it in the early 1900s. We went through it after World War II. Uh, and the question is simply this: What is the purpose of the system? What is the purpose? Uh, I don't know. Not in the United States. If I'm in Europe. Or well, certainly in the UK, I do. But here, I haven't heard, for example, in, in any of this discussion, anything about the patient. I've heard about your wonderful technology. I've heard about wonderful things the Cleveland Clinic is doing. Organizations which years ago were very prominent in academia are now very prominent at selling themselves. And we have a crisis. It's a very real crisis. But I think we really do have to start with the question of 
what is the purpose of the healthcare system? And once we've defined that and agreed about that, then how you build that out becomes much more obvious. What do you think the purpose is? I'm asking you that question. But what do you think it is? I'm asking you. I'm going to leave that to people. <laughs> what, what, what is the purpose of the health care system? You don't know? Well, here, here's what I... Here, you know, the, if you look at this from federalism perspective, it's to promote the general welfare, I think, is the Ninth Amendment rights. And obviously, we don't have a federal sort of mandate on uh, what medic or health care is, other than what the efforts of HHS have evolved basically in, the, in the, the 20th century and moving forward. So what is the purpose of health care for we as an, an American society or as a body politic? Is that the, is that, it, it's going to be 20 percent of our GMP. Yeah. yeah. I think we've all care system. Yeah. I think you can go back to the barbers. I think you can go back to the country doctors. I think we, as an American culture, whether right or wrong, have access doctors when we haven't felt well. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be wrong, but my, I, I, I think if you look historically, that's how we have established ourselves. It does, but it, it, it may not address the why, but it certainly addresses the... I, I, you know, absolutely yeah. we can draw the parallels of different countries. I mean, China being one of the best for how you yeah. pay a physician to keep you well versus paying a physician to treat you when you're sick. But if you look historically at the United States, I'm not sure we've ever been a pay-to-keep-me-healthy system. Now, it may be our downfall, but I suspect that um, we've always been a sick access system. It's, uh, it's a safety net so when you get sick to get back to doing what you were doing, get back to work. It's the get, get back, back to, to it's the get back to, to work system. That, that yes. work ethic, yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's right, but my, my, my gut is that it's the get back to work system. But I think that's where actually the conversation started, which was healthcare or any insurance policy doesn't pay for preventative care. If you go to any, you know, all of us have health insurance or whoever has health insurance, you go to a preventative care, you know, uh, doctor, none of it's covered. For the majority of the time. So is health care a right or a responsibility? Um, I think it's both. I think it's, it's both. both. It's a responsibility. 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 It's a right. Right. A right responsibility in both. Health is a responsibility. Health care is a right. Yes, health is a responsibility. Right. Health care is a responsibility. Health no. is a responsibility. Health care, care is, is a right. right. Yes. We will get to you. I'm not sure where the microphones are. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to go back for a moment to the Gowande article because I think uh, in addition to the negative example provided in Texas, there's also an example provided in Grand Junction here in Colorado. And when you ask the stakeholders in the Grand Junction community, you know, I mean, they're one of the very few communities in this country now that has been identified as, you know, having the holy grail. They've got great health care outcomes and they've got really low costs. And so you ask them, first of all, I asked you know, a few weeks ago, I had a chance to meet with these stakeholders, and we're very interested in partnering with DOD because we want to accelerate cultural change and build resilience, all these things we're talking about, so I'm excited to be here. But I asked them, I said, okay, what has been the most common reaction, all this publicity since the first week in June? What's the reaction been? Are people flocking to Grand Junction to learn these lessons? And secondly... What's your story? How'd you get here? Very interesting. They smiled. <laughs> they took a deep breath. And, at, you, know, you know, chief of the HMO there and, and you know, the VA and uh, several of the docs and rehab. So it was a good cross-section. Uh, in fact, we met right here at Aspen about a month ago. And, and they said, okay, in, in answer to your first question, the feedback that we've gotten so far is, oh, Good on you, Grand Junction, Colorado. You're a small town. Everybody gets along. They love each other in small towns. This is not, this isn't scalable. That leads then to the answer to the second question. They said, actually, 
Grand Junction, we were identified, I think it was back in the early 90s, Rand Corporation was doing a study, and they identified Grand Junction as being the worst community in the country in terms of dysfunctional and conflicted relationships within their healthcare stakeholders. And they said what happened then, as we were forced to talk to each other as a part of this study, we found that actually it wasn't just about, you know, getting past our personal differences, although it, it was that, but it was about essentially figuring out how do we reverse the tragedy of the commons. And we found that by communicating, by being creative, by reaching out to Medicare and saying, hey, we want the uniform reimbursement rates here in this area because we don't want to incentivize cherry picking. And we have a health information network so that we all have in access to the same information. We talk to each other. We bring the patient and the family into the center of the mix. And you know what? We think it's scalable. So it's something to, to think about. And I don't know if anybody from Grand Junction is here, but uh, I have no stock in Grand Junction, but I think that Atul Gawande really brought up a fascinating model that perhaps might have some applicability to the larger national challenge. Thank you. Not being not being a patient centric, but being everything else centric. Yes. Next. Yes. Hello. We've got two points. The first is to actually finish what the gentleman here started. So uh, we live in uh, America, which is the epitome of capitalism, free markets. So healthcare, the answer is that it's a business in this country. And uh, businesses focus on what really is going to buy the most business, right? So if you have healthy patients, then where's the business? And second, um, I'm not sure if you agree or not with that, but, uh, <laughs> but second, um, sodium. Americans are dying from heart disease. And um, as our dear chef here is going to represent Stouffer's, are you going to encourage them to have less sodium in a 12 ounce? I just actually pulled up on my laptop. So you get 825 milligrams of sodium per six ounces in mac and cheese. Doctors tell us that... How many, how many milligrams of sodium? 825. So that's a third of, more than a third of the day's requirement. And a kid is going to come home and he's going to eat the whole, or she is going to eat the whole thing, and they're going to take in a huge amount of sodium. And that's going to raise blood pressure, and um, we're going to deal with more sick patients. So, so the, the, that's a very, it's a valid about profiting off health care. Corporation, corporation, you feed people. You all profit off of people's health and wellness. How do you sleep at night? <laughs> but you know what, I, just, to answer, just to answer the question, um, and even the point that was brought up about McDonald's and, and feeding, the, all of these um, businesses have been around for, for years, for years. I grew up on McDonald's, I grew up on Stouffer's. Um, and but do you have a, do you have, but that's a very but valid point. It is, it's a very valid point. Stouffer's on the right track. At, it is, they, they're starting to become more aware. But I think that what happens is, instead of using these products like McDonald's to maybe do, you know, once a month or having your Stouffer's, you know, once a week or whatever it is, and it's a nightly thing, you know what I mean, where the entire idea of actually cooking a meal at home is completely out the window, teaching our children about... Um, their, you know, their own abilities to make dinner or, you know, this is how we make this from scratch are completely gone. When we're using it on a nightly or we're allowing a child to eat an entire portion of macaroni and cheese, which it's not meant for, that's where, that's where we get into problems. Because, like I said, was I allowed as a child to eat McDonald's every single night? Was that my dinner? No. I ate it once a month. You know, if we were going on vacation and we happened to stop by, we're using these facilities as this is the only thing out there to eat. So it, it's about keeping yourself organized. It's about being educated. And there's no, I mean, everything in moderation. We hear that term all the time. You know, it's not like we're not going to, we're going to make a macaroni and cheese at home and it's going to be no salt, you know, fat-free cheese, and that's going to be the answer. You know, there's no reason that, you know, there's an indulging every once in a while. People do it all the time. But it's about having that on an, a nightly basis, about pe teaching people that we have, you know, you know a, a burger and french fries from McDonald's Monday through Friday because we can't get anything else. Mike, y you, you make a living. 
based on healthiness. I mean, you, your job is to bring home a profit. You work for a multinational corporation. And you, I would assume, sort of wear two hats. I mean, I, I mean but we're also, if you, think, if you think back before MR and CT, there are a lot of times there were exploratory surgeries. So imaging technology was able to actually improve outcomes and improve what was being done in less costly procedures. Minimally, minimally evasive procedures with surgical C-arms can be done. Uh, arthroscopic surgery. So there's, there's things that we're doing from a technology perspective to actually, again, look at outcomes and improve when somebody does have to enter into the system. We're all for early diagnosis. We're all for prevention. Part of our profitability will come from NBC Universal and patient education and providing that information more so than it might come from our equipment. We're fine with that, but it's going to be in context with the, the, the real dynamics that exist in the societies where we provide products and services. And we'll provide those products and services always trying to help rein in costs. That's one of our stated examples is to try to help with the cost area and also access, which turns into costs oftentimes in other parts of the world. Scott? Everything you say sounds wonderful. But if you really mean what you say, your job is to put yourself out of business. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, Alice Park stated that very well with one of our, uh, in the last month of time, in the last month of time magazine about this doctor does not want to see you. And it was one of our leading uh, cardi preventive cardiology uh, physicians, um, uh, Gordon Blackburn. We are a nonprofit. And we, have a, we are a nonprofit with over $5 billion in revenue. Um, which means profit. Which means we, we, we reinvest in the science and the state of medicine. And what we have to do is make that science and make those medical innovations and make the, that innovation available to not only our patients and the caregivers and the communities we serve, but really everyone we serve in the United States. So we are uh, definitely reinvesting that money and making sure our science and our innovation is accessible to, to everyone. But if science and innovation, and, and look, I, I get science and innovation, but if, if, if our science and innovation help also ratchet up our health care costs, and there's good evidence mm -hmm. to show that, you know, people love their total body CT scans, and then it just starts this avalanche of ridiculous <laughs> testing. So I have to hold you two guys accountable for that. Absolutely. <laughs> And here, here, is, here is what I say. The more an individual knows about his or her health, as an empowered, informed consumer, the better able they are, a, the better able they are, are to source out active ingredients and products and services over the counter in the drugstores, in the Walmarts, at uh, fast food chains, in supermarkets, to really input into their body things that make an, a more optimal way of living or a more optimal health output based on their risk, I think is a very good thing overall. So again, giving people truth and guidance absolutely has to be a result of science and innovation what we do. Making it available, providing the truth, providing the truth about sodium. You know, you know sodium many times actually gets a bad rap in, 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 in nutrition. Uh, in, in certain, absolutely, I, I agree. There's some extreme examples out there, but um, making science and truth accessible to the public is important, and providing guidance on how to use everything that's an active ingredient toward health is very important. We in this country spend 15 billion dollars on vitamins. In many in many cases, the vitamins don't contain the active ingredients in an optimized way that allow the person to achieve the achieve the health goal they're looking for. Wellness in this industry, if you look at the entire market segment of wellness, it's a 256 billion dollar industry from everything from vitamins, supplements, and nutraceuticals to fitness center memberships. Obviously, the American consumers are engaged. They're wanting to buy and consume products that help them achieve optimal health. Academic medical centers need to stand ready to provide the guidance and the truth around those products. I'm not sure where the microphone is. Yes, sir. Okay. On that theme of, you know, kind of the theme of this evening thing was engaging and empowering the consumer. And I'm just curious as to the panel's thoughts on you know, if you look at some of the research done by the Pew Charitable Trust, mm -hmm. over 70% of people, I think, it was, I think it was 78% of people with internet access have done a healthcare-related search. 
in the past year. And if you look across all the demographics, whether it's the young immortals to the uh, World War II veterans, it's usually about in the top five mm -hmm. of all the things they do on the internet. So as consumers are going out there anyway, getting information, using it, making decisions about their health, so in a certain extent, they're doing self-care. So how does this, and this is only going to increase, I believe, mm -hmm. in the future as we start seeing people move from the modality of a laptop to the modality of a smartphone and using an iPhone. And the iPhone now has, what, 1,500 medical-related apps now? Including the Cleveland Clinic? Cleveland Clinic That's has right. one. Oh. WebMD has one. <laughs> Netscape has one. Hippocrates. Shameless. I mean, you can go down the list. There's a, there's a ton of them there. But as we have, you know, okay, so what, my question to the panel is this. What is the future role in the healthcare industry of the physician in this new modality and this new model? Because this industry is very, very tradition bound. And you mean by industry, the physician? The physician mm. industry, yes. The physician practice, how they practice medicine, how they deliver it, how, it's, how it actually occurs today. And the consumers are starting to take things into their own hands to a certain extent. And how is that going to change the practice of medicine? Now that we start having more engaged consumers, more empowered consumers, and if you start looking at the healthcare IT stuff that's coming down the pike from DC, mm -hmm. start talking about personal health records and communications and virtual health visits and yada, yada, yada. And, and I agree, and I think we're agreeing increasingly to people access the system, so self-treat and when it doesn't work, See a Access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get to go first. The last word for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, I think the, 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 pr the practice of medicine is, is going to continue to evolve. The way we train new physicians and even our own medical school at Cleveland Clinic is, is, is certainly, certainly reflective and reorienting itself toward a better informed patient. You know, we know that you know, nearly 6% of the, 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 the patients that come to the Cleveland Clinic get a lot of their medical information from Oprah or Dr. Oz or even Dr. Nancy. We know that media drives a lot of macro messaging, so we need to be aware of that. I think the role of the physician, though, is going to be that person that provides truth and guidance and gets the person to, to the health outcome or the medical outcome that they need to achieve. But do you think the doctor will have a subordinate role in the future? No, I think doctors will always have a, a, an important critical leadership role. I don't think it will be subordinated. I just think it will be uh, reoriented to become, become more part of the team approach. Do you think it will be subordinated? Subordinate. I agree with you. I think it's going to be very important because if you, even when you go out there and search, it often is not just the standard of care. Even as you said, you see a patient and another doctor sees a patient, with, it can be treated differently based on your perspective. Right. It's a very important to understand on those outcomes what's the standard of care to reduce variation. Mm -hmm. And so if in, by f providing this information technology to the doctor, I think the doctor is going to be the harbinger of the standard of care because the patient will find out all kinds of things that could be done for a particular condition. But a doctor can say the standard of care is the outcome that we need to get for you should be X, Y, Z. That's what a doctor has to be able to do. We'll see. And on that, Mike, Scott, and Antonio, thank you, and have a great conference, everyone. <laughs>